I'm Jeff Gedner with American Purpose. Thank you all. You're busy and you have a lot of Zoom invitations, including on this subject the week before midterms. Our guest of honor, many of you know him well and personally, Bill Crystal. Bill, you're to be respected and admired and are respected and admired by me for, for many reasons, but one is you've always been so good in this town and this industry in mentoring and supporting younger talent and startups and people in our network. And it's just a tremendous and decent, honorable that you do it, how you do it. In, in my case, I'm not a young professional, but in the course of two years of the startup American Purpose, started by Frank Tsukiyama, who's with us today, me, you've been uh, of endless support in countless ways. Thank you for that. And then third and last but not least to the matter at hand, you all, I really do think we have in the person of Bill, one of the sharpest, most knowledgeable and thought-provoking commentators on the subject midterms the next Congress. Bill's going to tell us whatever he wants to tell us. It's my own view, I think Bill's view, that we're not doing horse races today, although we can, like nobody's business, but to talk about the more shape of things, both the midterms, the outcome, but also both parties and policies. That may take us domestic. It may take us Ukraine. Let's see. But thank you all for making time. Bill, you have the floor. Say whatever you want to say, and then we're going to pepper you with questions. Bill, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks for those kind words, which I could reciprocate, but it would take valuable time. So I'm not, I won't even do it except to say what you said about me, which was nice. I could certainly say about you and, and about so many others on this call. And um, I'll be brief. I'll try to be brief. I'll, I'll try to make five points, I think, I was thinking about this, which is a lot, but I'll make them genuinely briefly and try to sort of top line, you know, bulletin points and let uh, we can follow up as people wish. Okay. Number one, <laughs> 2022 midterms. I mean, let's look at the forest, not the trees. It's going to be 50-50. I mean, it could be 51-49. It could be 49-51 in the Senate. It could be the House, probably Republican by a few seats, governors. But, but basically, the nation is evenly divided. It was pretty evenly divided in 2016, pretty evenly divided in 2020. And that's bad, in my view, in the sense that one might have thought after four years of Trump as president, after January 6th in particular, after other, uh, after the Republican Party nominating people who were Trumpy and in some cases Trumpy plus in terms of conspiratorialists and uh, election deniers and other kinds of uh, extremism, after a Supreme Court decision which was unpopular and and uh, you know done by made possible by three Trump appointees to the court, one might have expected more movement in. Uh, against the Republican, against the Trumpy Republican Party. Now there are countervailing factors. Biden's the incumbent. Off your elections usually go in this way, but I think just to step back, it's it's if people thought that Trump Trump personally would be broken by January sixth or by other things, if they thought the Trumpist fever was going to break, to use that metaphor, uh, it hasn't. He hasn't been broken, and hasn't it hasn't broken. And that's something people just need to be serious about going forward and not kind of keep hoping in a sense that we're going to be rescued by, you know, American exceptionalism and these fevers always break. And this one's maybe they do. They do maybe eventually, but the fever metaphor is not not a good one for this reason, I think. More like a, an infection that's been checked, but is very much in the body politic and, and in my view, a threat, a threat to it. What's going to happen Tuesday? I mean, obviously, this many close races, so much dependent on outcome, um, on, on turnout, which we don't know. Is it a sort of typical off-year turnout against the incumbent party? Is it is it a Trump-era turnout where you do get disproportionate turnouts on both sides, and maybe in some places more for the Democrats, so some Democratic hidden voters, do young people vote? So hard to know. My feeling is, if I had to bet right now, Senate stays Democratic. I actually think they could pick up a seat or two. Uh, House does go Republican. And one thing that's happening, this is not, I'll just make this one point because it's been sort of under commented on the thing is, I feel like there's, they're countervailing, it's not a wave. I do think that I'd be very surprised if we have a red wave. We have countervailing forces going on, unhappiness with Biden, 8.5% inflation, unhappiness with Trump extremism, some parts of the country that already were trending a little bit Republican, trending more that way. And by parts, I don't mean all states, but often congressional districts or parts of districts. Other parts, the opposite dynamic happening. 
And so we have more of a, a mixed, you know, set of uh, mini waves or, or trends, I guess, going on. So the wave metaphor, maybe not, not the best. Um, I do think the Senate and the House could go in different directions, i.e. Democrats picking up seats in the Senate, Republicans picking up seats in the House. And I think that reflects the fact that the, there are a fair number of House seats that have stayed Democratic, though they look like other, like Trumpy Republican House seats. They just happen to be in New York or rural Oregon or California inland empire. And somehow the blue, the fact that they're in blue states has sort of held back their progress, if that's the right word, in a Trumpy direction. I'm obviously I'm simplifying a lot here, but people understand what I mean. A lot of these New York districts, both on the island, and especially upstate of it, look like central Pennsylvania. They haven't voted quite like central Pennsylvania because they're in New York probably, or because they have other differences, but they could go in that direction. So I would not be surprised to see Republicans pick up House seats in blue states. Conversely, in these Senate races in the swing states, you know, there are a heck of a lot of, heck of a lot of young, diverse Democratic voters in the Atlanta area, and there are more of them every two years. And I do think it's why Warnock could well hang on in Pennsylvania, in Georgia. It's why Pennsylvania is more complicated, but there are an awful lot of suburban voters around Philadelphia and Pittsburgh who are not enamored of Trump. There's been an interesting movement in southern and western states where some of the dull Eisenhower Republicans, if I could put it that way, seem to be drifting further away from Trump, which is why Oklahoma could have a Democratic governor. And there's congressional districts in Kansas look surprisingly Democratic-ish. So I think it's important maybe just to liberate ourselves. Maybe there will be a wave, incidentally, but my instinct is there might not be, and it's probably worth liberating ourselves from that metaphor and thinking more uh, in a way, in a more traditional way, uh, despite the nationalization of our politics, despite the polarization, those remain hugely important. There, you can't have different things going on in different parts of the country and in different socioeconomic type areas at the same time. And I suspect that's what we'll, what we'll see. Governors, I think secretaries of state look pretty good for the Democrats. I, uh, I don't, I think the, especially secretary of state, the election denial thing is costing some of the Republican nominees, governors, we'll see. Third, um, so mixed bag, countervailing forces, either way, basically very close though. I mean, you could, it matters who wins, God knows. So I'll come to that in a second. But at the end of the day, if one person wins 50 to 49 and the other person in one state and someone else loses 50 to 49 and another, you can't really draw too much in the way of huge, you know, consequences, huge uh, implications about American public opinion, though who wins matters, obviously, in, in practice. Republican Party, um, you know, the big story is obviously Trump's dominance, Trump. And something here does depend on who wins. I mean, if, if the candidates whom Trump recruited to run, supported in primaries and helped win primaries, and now is supported in general elections, if they win, people could say till they're blue in the face that, gee, you know, they also, Mastriano also lost. But at the end of the day, if Carrie Lake wins in Arizona and Oz wins in Pennsylvania and Herschel Walker wins in Georgia and Michaels, I think it's same, wins in, wins in Wisconsin, and I'm sure I'm now missing a few other obvious ones, in key, in key states, um, they wouldn't exist without Trump. I mean, Dr. Oz, for all his celebrity, was not going to be the next senator of Pennsylvania. He would lose to McCormick or to that other person in the primary. And the same would be true. Most, a lot of these states, the establishment supported, uh, governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey supported Carrie Lake's primary opponent. I mean, those people are there because of Trump. They know they're there because of Trump. Trump's going to say they're there because of Trump. If a appreciable number of them win, and I think at least one or two probably will. Um, it's just going to allow Trump to say, look, it's my party. And in the House, the general flavor of the House Republicans who will win who will, win, will be pretty Trumpy. And uh, I guess J.D. Vance would be another person like, who wouldn't exist without Trump as a candidate, right? He would have lost to one of the other people in the primaries. So, so here, even though they'll all be close, it sort of matters how many of them win, I think. I think, the, I think either way, it's a Trumpy Republican party. But if... Lake wins and J.D. Vance wins and, I don't know, Herschel Walker wins and Oz wins. I mean, it's, I mean, it's really Trumpy on steroids. And incidentally, every single person who wants to make it as a, is thinking of going to politics as a Republican, what lesson do they like take from those races, as well as many, many House races and lower ballot races? The way to be a star is to be a mini Carrie Lake, or if not quite Carrie Lake, at least Certainly not to take on Trump. That's the Liz Cheney route. Which, uh, but even not to be too distant from Trump. You need Trump support in a Republican primary. 
almost everywhere in the country at this point going forward. Like, uh, that's what you'll think. You might not be right, but I think that's will be the conventional wisdom after this election. It's not going to be obviously wrong. So the notion that, you know, there's going to be a move away from Trump and the elite Republicans would prefer DeSantis and, and Glenn Youngkin, isn't he the best of both worlds? People can say that and think it, and it may be true at some abstract level, but in the real world <laughs> of Republican primary politics, I think Trump and Trumpism come out of this election very strong with the caveat that it sort of matters which of these candidates wins and if there's any margin to speak of, what the margin is. But Trump will simply say you know, he's won. He'll announce, I suppose now people are saying the week after the election, I myself think, why shouldn't he just announce on election day? That would actually be kind of clever in my view, you know, getting every single, you know, it'd be, everyone would say it's stupid, typical Trump, showboat, how, doesn't he understand how things work? Of course, he'd be in every story, quite prominently, every TV broadcast, the one night that Americans are paying attention to politics, you know, some one of these people is going to win. And then he'll be there saying, see, I picked this person and he or she won, but I don't know. But so Trump probably runs and Trump, I think is stronger all, you know, unless the results are pretty surprising, Trump, Trump is stronger as a result of this election. Um, and the Republican party is, you know, as strong as it's been. A democratic party, a lot to be said, but one point I would make is I mean, I just question it. Will they learn less? Will they, will they say, gee, things haven't gone quite as much in our direction as we hoped, which probably be the case. And we need to learn from the people who've done well. And that's Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania. I'd say it's Tim Ryan in Ohio, whether or not he wins, if he can run close in a state that Trump won by eight. It's, you know, Spanberger and Luria and lots of others who are either will win or lose close races in, in tough districts. I don't know. Does the Democratic Party have the discipline to sort of say, what lessons can we learn from successful candidates? Or is it all just kind of, you know, we just have to keep attacking Trump, which God knows I'm in favor of, but I mean, but would not rethink anything much and double down behind Biden and so forth. I think if Democrats do badly, moderately badly, even, um, for all that, everyone now is on board with Biden. And of course, if he wants to run again, we're not, I'm not going to challenge him and all that. I think that goes away pretty fast. I mean, I just think if Democrats don't do well, the, the sense of let's have a, it's time for generational change, really. And also politically, it's a good idea. I think that will build up a lot on the Democratic side, even though no one is saying it uh, right now. And finally, uh, a foreign policy, I should say, versus we're on this particular group. Um, you know, part of me thinks, I've, I've been saying for months, I'm not too worried about the Republican uh, uh, pro Putinism or anti Ukraineism, because at the end of the day, Biden's president and he can sustain an awful lot with even uh, troublemaking by one or both houses of Congress. And even there, the Republican Party said United, some Marjorie Taylor Greene said something, you know, basically, no, no more money for Ukraine. But Tom Cotton said this morning, there will be money for Ukraine. And McConnell certainly believes that. And even at the House, there are some who believe it. And if Biden is strong, and I think he will be on this, he can sustain, you know, his foreign policy, I think in that area, and probably in, in most. Um, having said that, I mean, the trend is very bad. Was there a Wall Street Journal poll? I think I saw this morning or something that, you know, 5% of Republicans wanted to limit aid to Ukraine six months ago, and now it's 45% or something like that. And so that's not good. And, and I defer to others on this call, you and others. I mean, how much effect does it have over in Europe if they see what half, let's say, of one of the two major parties being turning anti-Ukraine, to oversimplify a little, turning anti-Ukraine even if it's not going to have any direct effect. I mean, Bush beat back the attempts to cut off funding for Iraq in 07, 08, which was a very different, much worse circumstance, more difficult circumstance for Bush to sustain that. And he sustained the surge amazingly. But it also did have the effect ultimately of telling everyone that, look, we're getting out of there pretty soon. And of course, Obama moved that to the presidency. So if, you know, it, it, I don't think, I don't think, Aid to Ukraine is stopping on January 5th when the new Congress is sworn in or anything like that, or even on July 4th. But does it erode some of the sense abroad? And does it erode the sense in Putin's mind that we're strong? And does it make it easy for Europeans to get to waver because we seem to be wavering? I think all oh, that's quite possible. So I'm, I'm less dismissive of the damage that could be done in foreign policy than I was a few months ago. 
though still, I think, which is just presidents have an awful lot of leeway. And, and even in the Republic of the Party, there is if 45% are now against war if Ukraine, the middle of 55% or 45% or something, uh, there's someone decided are for it. So it's not, it's not, we're not in an Iraq situation yet, but we're not, it's, it's worrisome that Marjorie Taylor Greene said what she said. And, and look, history, a final point of history would suggest over the last two, three, four, five years, and my colleague, I just did Charlie Sykes podcast, and he made this point well, that, you know, the stuff that starts out as fringy stuff becomes semi-mainstream. And, you know, the next time you look up three quarters of the party is embracing it, right? And I mean, I don't think that's out of the question that we have, you know, a real America first Republican party six or nine months from now, especially if things get tougher over there and Putin has fake, you know, offers of diplomacy and so forth. So I'm kind of worried about the foreign policy implications without being, uh, but more in the medium term than in the very short term. Bill, thank you very much. A fine point and a lot of material covered. The floor is open. Use the raised hand function, please. When I fail to see you, Michelle will let me know and we'll get you into the conversation. Anybody first? And as you're collecting your thoughts, I have a first. Bill, um, it's all speculation, but you ended there. If you could continue to just for a moment to, to the medium term. Uh, so we talked about Ukraine and we've all talked about Kevin McCarthy's comment about no more blank checks, but, but sketch out a little bit ahead to 2024, looking at both the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the Trumpian national conservative wing of the Republican Party and our ability to cohere in foreign policy. And we always talk about fighting two wars on two fronts in terms of military capabilities, but, but also now, if I may pose the question this way, in terms of political cohesion, um, what does America look like if we're supporting Ukraine and there's a crisis in the Middle East with Iran, or there's a crisis in East Asia with China in the next six to 12 to 18 months? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if my engine or yours for going in and having a little there, but I missed a few of those uh, sentences, but I think I got the thrust of, the, of what you were saying. So I'll, I'll answer if, if my internet's working okay. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, the good news on the Democratic side, I think, is, you know, 30 progressives signed a letter that was, you know, signaling a, a wish to be less aggressive, let's just say, and less forthright, less resolute in helping Iran and helping, Iran, and helping Ukraine. And um, it got, it went nowhere. It ended up being, it was repudiated quickly by Pelosi and the Biden administration. And they ended up having to withdraw it. So I, I'm, you know, I'm happy to worry about the progressives. That's not my wing of the party. It's as far as I have a wing of the party and, and they can do damage over the, again, medium long term. But yeah, right now, I got to say the Democrats are pretty, are hanging in there. I don't really have much to, I mean, there are things I would do differently. But and I wish they were a little more aggressive on Ukraine and on Iran. They maybe they deserve some criticism. But all in all, compared to where I thought we would be three years ago or ten years ago, you know, when Obama was backing off on the Syria red line and and we were still in reset with Russia and then you know uh, and with Putin, uh, I, I think it's I feel okay about the Biden administration, the Democratic Party. Now whether he'll have a united country behind him as we have. And in saying 2023 in Congress is another question. And, and it's on the Republican side, as I said, I think the trend is, is uh, the status quo is pretty Trumpy and the trend is to more Trumpiness. At least the, over the last five, six years, that would be the bet you would make. It's going to get more that way, not less that way, since it has in every other aspect of our politics, basically. And so maybe Marjorie Taylor Greene is the, the leading edge, so to speak, um, of where we are. Final point, I think you said something about our unity in general, and one of the two of the times you cut out a bit. I mean, people are underestimating, I think, how crazy 2023 is going to be. I mean, we're going to have Trump to get indicted. The Republican House, assuming they control the House, will promptly impeach Garland, will triple its you know investigations of Hunter Biden, uh, will try to defund parts of the Justice Department. There could be you know threats and intimidation and unfortunately violence in terms of court proceedings, as well as obviously I'm worried also even about next week with the elections, but leaving that aside, I just think the degree of chaos and of distemper to say the least, but a genuine sort of civic unrest at home could be very great. And the 
Republicans in particular seem to have no compunctions about pulling it back, trying to pull it back at all. Obviously, the reaction to the attack on Mr. Pelosi is in a way very uh, worrisome in that respect, um, very disheartening. And so I am worried, and this is where that has an effect that everywhere, of course, that, that I am worried. People might look at us in four or five, six months and think this country is really a mess. And, you know, maybe in some narrow sense, the DOD is sending over 80% of the weapons it should be to to uh, the Iran, to the Ukrainian government. And we're saying some of these things about the Iranian demonstrators, but are we really able to sort of to execute and to be a reliable partner? I think those those doubts could go up. Bill, no, thank you. Let's go to Jeffrey Bergman, and then after Jeffrey Bergman, John Mosh. Um, well, thank you very much. So I, I think um, this sort of goes in line with with something with some of the comments that Bill was just making. But I'm I'm wondering if he thinks that that nationally the Democrats, either in or out of the government, um, the Biden administration or others, it, do people have a plan? Yeah, but things start to go south, either, you know, through, you know, maybe somebody, you know, maybe Mastriano loses his election um, in Pennsylvania decisively, as soon as possible, and he refuses to concede and, you know, calls supporters out or something goes bad and there's violence somewhere else. Because it seems to me, just as an observer, that the sort of the, the plan so far has been almost sort of, well, you know, President Biden gives a speech every every month or so, and it's a good speech about democracy and how important it is. But then it doesn't convince anybody who wasn't already convinced. And I, I'm wondering, is there a, you know, I guess, is there a plan B that, that we're not seeing? Because I hope there is. Um, yeah, well, I'll say we're then going to jot. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think the Justice Department and law enforcement, uh, homeland security types of, and at the state and federal level have done a fair amount of work actually uh, quietly about, um, you know, trying to prevent the nightmare scenario just for the next week, leaving aside the future, even in terms of, you know, 10,000 people, some armed people assembling outside the Arizona convention hall when Carrie Lake, who would have been ahead at midnight Tuesday night is behind by 8 a.m. Wednesday morning and says, we need to go over there and prevent them from stealing the election. And you can really write nightmare scenarios. Pennsylvania seems to be a state they're very focused on. I don't think Mastriano gets close enough to make it plausible, but if Oz is very close, they'll make it about that, or maybe some state legislative raises and so forth. Trump's going there Saturday and it will be, it will be totally irresponsible in this way. And I think he already did, did it yesterday. And I was said something pretty bad about, you know, they're not gonna, people aren't gonna stand for the election being stolen again. You know, they're gonna rise up, you know, sort of vague <laughs> threats of that nature. Uh, when I've argued, I've sort of been on the alarmist side of this and have suggested that some alarm, some public alarmism might be useful. And people have said in that, both in government, but more out of government, in the, I don't know what you call it exactly, counterterrorism, you know, preventing the political violence world. People who know much more about this than I know, you, gotta, you don't want to really talk about it much because it gives people ideas in a sense. And, you know, you want to assume, it's very good for the country if everyone assumes these elections will go smoothly because... There's some truth to this. I mean, if everyone thinks it will, maybe it will. And people will be then shocked at a call to violence and not respond. Whereas in a way, you don't want to legitimate it by warning too much about it. I, I don't know. I'm of two minds about that. I don't. So I think there is more planning than we see. Uh, but I would say that I think generally there's still, I was in one call the other day and yeah, I sort of raised this alarm. So well, we've prepared a book that shows how the voting works, you know, booklet in these different states and why you can be misled on election night because of the same phenomenon as 2020 and why why ballots, some ballots take longer to count. Did you know that in Pennsylvania, it's the Republican state legislature that's in fact ensured that there's a misleading number, uh, which is true on election night because they won't let them count the early votes early. And so those votes get counted only really Wednesday morning and after. Uh, and they prepared a booklet on that. And as if like, really, I don't think the point, this is not a good faith, like confusion on the part of people, you know, maybe it was once, maybe it is still on the part of some followers, but no one at any level from the top to the middle is confused. They know what they're doing. They want chaos. They want uh, disarray. They want some violence. Honestly, I would say a lot of them because they think it helps them going forward. And that's what worries me the most. And I, I, I so I sort of agree if I take your point that, correctly that yeah, people aren't alarmed enough about that side of things. And even if they do a pretty good job, you know, in the, in the practical way of having enough National Guard ready to go in Phoenix on when, I hope they do on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. if necessary. So, Bill Chaffee, thank you very much. John, welcome. 
Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, Phoenix is my hometown, and if um, if Katie Hobbs wins the governorship, it won't be my much. And I just don't see Carrie Lake conceding that election, um, given the way she's run and her temperament. Uh, I think she's aiming for national office and will use election denial in her election as a way to do it. And um, there's all kinds of mischief that can result from that. A uh, question, or let me actually try a hypothesis on you, Bill, a discouraging hypothesis and see if you think it's correct. This is the first election, obviously, since January 6th. We've had an enormous amount of evidence come out. We've had the committee, of course, it's pretty clearly shows that there was conspiracy to overthrow the government. You, we all know all of this. Uh, Joe Biden, among others, has tried to raise this as an issue in the election. He tried again, what, two days ago at Union Station. Hypothesis, it is not going to be possible to make defense of democracy um, a voting issue for the electorate. It is just not going to happen. We need to give up and talk about gas prices. True, false, in Wayne? I mean, I'm, I'm true in the sense that I think there's not much evidence. It's some evidence that it's, you know, hurting Master. Why is Master Johnny running, you know, 10 points behind Oz? I mean, there's some, there's some truth to the notion that people get a little freaked out if you're too far down that road, perhaps, of election denial, or just general, maybe that's where general extremism is a little hard to disentangle since they, there's a high correlation of the election, the most rabid election denial with other forms of conspiracies and extremism that could be off-putting. But yes, generally, I think you're unfortunately right. I don't know that we can really give up. I don't think that's quite what you mean to say either in terms of making the case and therefore, but we do need to, you know, this is where I said they need to talk to Josh Shapiro and say, well, how did you win? And to Tim Ryan from federal office, maybe a better example. And how did you get so close or win in Ohio? And what did you talk about? He doesn't minimize that. I actually, and we have ads for Republicans, Republican Accountability Project have ads, Republicans for against Vance, and, uh, against J.D. Vance, which do focus on the kind of election denial stuff. And they seem to peel away a few good government Republicans but it's certainly not enough. I, I couldn't agree more with that. And this, despite, you mentioned the January 6th committee, and everyone thinks it's not appreciated in the ways, not only did they do a good job, substantively, I mean, Pelosi was able, pretty amazingly, I've got to say, to get all of her members to st step back, to let Liz Cheney be the face of the committee, to let Liz Cheney insist that Republicans be the main witnesses, both on videotape and in person. I mean, you can criticize the Democrats for a lot of things, but I kind of say the management of that was good better than I, I would expect, better than I've seen in most cases in Washington, in terms of this should have been, this was managed in a way that in principle could have appealed to the people who were willing to listen. And it wasn't, it didn't look like a bunch of rabid left wingers giving up and giving, giving you know, uh, and giving speeches, right? And so uh, the fact that it had so little punch apparently, um, electorally, maybe it had some, uh, really come back to that, is, is discouraging. I mean, the one thing one could say is, look, in a normal off year, you know, the Democrats might be losing by eight percentage points. That's what the Republicans lost by in 2018. That's what the Democrats lost by, I think, in, about that in 2014. So, uh, yeah, what the, yeah, what the Democrats lost by in 2010 and 14. So maybe it has got, maybe they're, you know, it's a less bad story politically than it would otherwise be because of the democracy concerns. That might be the strongest case you can make for democracy having real salience as, a, as an issue. Jeff, are you there? Forgive me. I'm unmuted. Yes. I'm going to ask something uh, uh, admittedly broad, and it goes to the topic of media and political culture. And uh, what, and John Pausch and others on this call, which John Rosh have written, tackled, managed this problem in different ways. But what, what do we do when we get to a point where a not insignificant part of the public, this way or that way, but I'm thinking about Trump voters, um, or not to be persuaded. And, and so if you walk in and, and you know that the other side will cheat because the definition of cheat is they won. Um, and it seems to me this starts to permeate conversations in lots of areas of American society. David Blankenhorn is doing this work with Braver Angels and it's very important to depolarize. But what happens when people don't want to be depolarized? Deep question. I mean, uh, I think before depolarizing, you have to defeat them, to be honest. And that means defeat them electorally, obviously. Uh, but it also means enforcing the law. I mean, I guess I, I didn't used to think this much about this, but the last year has moved me in this direction. 
it's kind of important that, I mean, one lesson people are taking is, and we all, we all people scream about uh, you know, the election denial and this and that, uh, terrible behavior, but who's being prosecuted? I mean, a bunch of people who stormed the Capitol being prosecuted, which is good. But like Mark Meadows is, was chief of staff to Trump, clearly did all kinds of things to try to subvert the election and overturn it. And um, I don't know, uh, when I came to Washington in 85, it was kind of fresh in people's minds that H.R. Haldeman and John Mitchell and John Ehrlichman and all these people had gone to jail. And that was kind of, a, I mean, it didn't affect me that much, but a deterrent to people behaving in that way. You know, it's kind of important to have people worried. And every state official who signed those fake elector things, I mean, and I don't want to be criticizing Garland, who was, for, so for all I know, was doing an excellent job. He's got a million things to balance there. But all the people who signed, knowingly signed, totally fake electoral college declarations, they paid a price. One or two lawyers have sort of been disbarred, I guess, or they're in the process of being disbarred, you know, uh, Giuliani and uh, a couple of others. But most of them are, most of them are doing fine. They're getting good contracts from Trump, from MAGA world. The failure of accountability is, is, is and again, I'm not really blaming anyone for this, but there's a general, that I think hurts. That is, I think it is one thing if you have a, People who don't want to be persuaded by evidence, but they also think, geez, I can't get involved in this. Because you know what? If, I, if I'm if i an armed person and I go to intimidate people in Phoenix, take John, John, John Rash or some town there, I could get in trouble. I could get arrested. Well, no, you know, it's not, you shouldn't do it. Now there's a court saying maybe it is a bad thing to do, but you don't have the real impression that the, uh, the law is coming down against these people in a way that I think would, have, would be healthy. So that I think makes it harder to... If that's sort of a precondition, I think, to getting people to say, wait, oh, gee, maybe hey, I shouldn't do this. It's not my interest. It'd be, maybe I'll rethink some of this stuff because a lot of it isn't deeply held. I mean, it, they, 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 they adopted these conspiracies very quickly. They could presumably walk away from them pretty quickly if, if they really decided it's not in their interest to continue to indulge them. But again, this is where I worry about next week. If, if a bunch of people who have I mean, literally come from nowhere in politics to being senators or governors, because they embrace these conspiracies. I mean, that's a terrible signal to send going forward. Oh, uh, thank you, Bill. David, you have the floor. Uh, Mel, do you have a kind of uh, distinction among different Trumpist types? I mean, it seems to me that at the very far end are the actual candidates for governor or secretary of state or election commissioner or whoever that there was actually some fear people would be elected who would be committed to uh, overturning the next election. And you suggested maybe that's not a winning issue. But I wonder, is, is there a sort of short list of how many of those people might win? Yes. I mean, I, yeah. So A, I think there's a general distinction that I have blurred over. So thank you for making this point. You know, Trumpist true believers, Trumpist accommodators, Trumpist rationalizers. I mean, it's an interesting question. And many people studied this over in different movements of this kind, you know, kind of which are more important. And I, I myself have always tried to say that it's, it's the, the, the establishment accommodation and rationalization is very, very important. You could have a very unpleasant populist authoritarian-ish movement that has the support of 10 or 20 or 30% of the country that ultimately doesn't really, you know, threaten, in a sense, the system in a way that I think it does once the so many establishment types in both the Republican Party and the conservative movement sort of get on board or sort of half on board or enough on board that they're not going to challenge it. So if there were 50 Liz Cheney's in the House and 10 in the Senate and a few governors, I think it would be, it would feel different, I, I, I feel like. Look, I, so I think the key stays, I just know this from our own little work at our Republican Accountability Project. Good news is, Mich so what are the key states? I'm just the swing states, really. So Michigan looks fine. The, the Republican Secretary of State candidate who really is kind of a lunatic is going to lose. And I think uh, the governor candidate will lose too. Pennsylvania, Shapiro will win. They appoint the Secretary of State. Uh, Wisconsin, we don't know with either. So that's a pretty bad uh, candidate running for governor against. So that's a little, and that is a Republican state legislature that's pretty pretty extreme for, you know, for a Midwestern state. So that's a little more worrisome. But Pennsylvania and Michigan, which are the two biggest states, I guess, that were uh, in the swing state list, um, are look okay. Georgia, the Republican governor and secretary of state are going to win, but they did up resist Trump in 2020. So that looks okay. Arizona with Carrie Lake. I mean, I think Fincham, the secretary of state candidate, will lose. But 
if you have a governor who's where Carrie Lake is and a compliance state legislature, which is a question still, that's not good. Ducey was good in 2020. He he didn't remember Trump was on the cell phone with him, and he didn't uh, you know didn't take the call as I recall unless he certified Arizona's votes. Um, and then Nevada, that one seems to be on a knife's edge. And I'd say the governor candidate's not great, but not not a lunatic. And I mean, he's got along with the election and all stuff, but he's probably not deep down invested in it. I think this is Nevada Secretary of State candidate, the Republican may lose. And I'm missing one, maybe I'm missing one or two more swing states, but I think those are the big three in the Midwest, the Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, Sunbelt states. So the, in a you know narrow sense, I think the threat of literal kind of overturning of the election in 2024 is maybe a little less than people feared six months ago. Supreme Court may not go full bore in for the independent state legislature theory, so that would also make it a little easier to resist. Uh, but on the other hand, the degree of to which, uh, you know, uh, threats of violence, intimidation, chaos have been normalized is, that's dangerous going forward, I think. So I, I sort of, uh, good news in a sort of retail way, maybe in some of these states, but the wholesale environment, I think is is bad, not good for democracy. So, no, thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, six and a half minutes left. Roy, if I may call on you. Sure, thanks. Uh, just kind of building on uh, what Jeffrey and you were saying, it, the, the, you know, three legs of government, right? And the, what's most striking to me and seems least talked about is Trump's effects on the judiciary, right? Like the number of federal appointees. And there is a view, I think, that, it's very strategic taking over both the mechanisms of elections and the mechanisms of contesting them in the judiciary, right? And I just wonder if you have any opinions about not only the Supreme Court, but kind of all the way down. Like you're really, you can go very deep and there's been a lot of, you know, appointees who have no experience in the law, no experience in uh, anything related to it. Um, I'm just wondering, well, I guess it's two parts. One, that effect, and then two, the, why hasn't he been prosecuted to on a federal level? Like, I just don't. Are we scared of something? Are we? Well, what's happening? I mean, as you said, there's so many things that are, you know, clearly never mind taking, you know, records. I mean, well before the taking of records back to his house. And I'm just curious, you have an opinion as to is it a, is it a fear of an uprising if that happens or, or what? I, I feel like I'm missing you. <laughs> So the first, I would say, both very good points. I mean, the courts did pretty well, did well in 2020, and they were all, almost every Trump appointee was already on the court by December of 2020, a couple got confirmed with the lame duck, I guess. So that's given people, and now they're Biden appointees joining them. And if if Democrats hold the Senate, that's why the Senate is pretty important, I think. There'll be another two years of Biden appointees, presumably. So the Supreme Court's its own story, but uh, at the appellate district court levels, um, People take a little bit of comfort in 2020, maybe too much. There's some signs of, of some of these Trump judges deciding to just, you know, go off on their own, so to speak. I think in the case of the special master in, in Florida kind of thing, but also they kind of get reined in. And so I don't know, the courts seem to me to be holding if a little more rickety than they were. And, um, and I don't know how much confidence with that. I'd say I am, you know, on a couple of calls like this with lawyer types and stuff and, they have a, too much confidence that because they have shown that some legal doctrine is ridiculous, or they have shown that some opinion is bad and should be overturned by the 11th Circuit, that it all is going to be well. And I do think it's very important in general for people to get a little bit out of the mindset of, you know, that we're in normal politics. And if you have the better argument, I mean, even if that was ever true, incidentally, but that we're in normal politics or normal, normal litigation. And if you have the better argument, you're in good shape. You know, I really showed those people up. And I, I mean... They don't, it's like today they're making fun of Trump for this stupid lawsuit down in Florida, but he knows what he's doing. He's casting doubt on the whole thing. He'll find one judge if he can to give him sort of a favorable ruling. Then he'll get all confused. It'll delay everything, which he needs anyway. I, I think people are underestimated. Yeah, there's too much still faith, if you want to put it this way. I mean, it's good to have faith in the legal system, but it's a little too much of that going around. Um, you know, the indictment and prosecution thing is very difficult. We, we have a good habit, a good tradition in this country of avoiding that, not prosecuting people uh, after they left off, especially not presidents, but even people who've served in administrations on the whole. And people like me will, among those who objected to it on, you know, Ron Contra, I'm sure some people did some things wrong, but we really want to be in the business five years later, dining people for your Cap Weinberger for some, you know, complicated 
thing that happened. So I think it's been an understandable reluctance on uh, both the Justice Department's and other you know people's part. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe, maybe again, not maybe overlearning some of the lessons of the past and not uh, not prosecute. I think the good documents thing, in a way, is a godsend in the sense that it is a very clear thing. And believe me, having been in government as other people on this call are or have been, the, the notion that you could just walk away with these documents is so insane. And so many other people have been prosecuted or plead, pled guilty to things that are much less uh, uh, dangerous, really, than what Trump did. I think that gives them an easier path than election overturning. But look, the, you know, I guess they're, I'm not aware of their responsibility is not to bring a case that they don't think they can win. I mean, or at least have a reasonable chance at winning. I don't know. Do we think there's a jury pool in this country that's going to be easy to find? That's just going to, you know, that's not going to give Trump a, a, at least a, you know, a, a, you know, a hung jury. I mean, they'll be in a, is there not, that's where it gets dangerous, right? And, and to be fair, if you brought a case and it didn't get, and it got, you got acquitted, or even if it was kind of a, a hung jury, um, maybe that's worse than not bringing the case. So I, I do think they had they've had a tough, you know, road to to, to navigate. Thanks. So thank you, Roy. Thanks, Bill. Bill, I'm going to take the liberty of asking the last question. Um, early on, uh, as Trump became the candidate, you were not a minimizer, rationalizer, Trump pragmatist. Um, Two part question. Has anybody, or rather, has anything surprised you from Trump and his followers these last five, six years? Was it as bad as you thought? Was it worse than you thought? And in the second part, um, you are so sober, but fundamentally, in my view, an optimist. Uh, the, the classic question what keeps you awake at night? If you think about the next couple of years, yeah, that's a that's such a long list to go over. It'd be a two-hour real long Zoom session, you know. The um, I mean, on the first point, I, you know, a lot of people say, "Why are you so anti-Trump?" And let's see what happens. And I mean, I was anti-Trump not because I didn't like some of his obviously his views on on, on policies. I didn't like him, but it was because I did. I will say, and I think this is true of many many people, we sort of saw what the consequences of unleashing this could be that we haven't had a demagogue as president. We haven't had this kind of demagogue uh, as, as willing to exploit divisions and make them worse and uh, mock the rule of law. Obviously, it's an international phenomenon, but in America, we've mostly been spared that. And so I think people, I, I'd say I, and I think most of my friends, you know, most of us on this call, I suspect, you know, thought this could get really bad. You don't know it's going to get that bad, but it could get bad. So in that respect, I do feel like this is why we were in anti-Trump. I mean, the, precisely the situation we're in today with people making fun of, you know, Mr. Pelosi's head getting uh, cracked in and, you know, by an intruder because, oh, that's kind of funny if violence is used against your political enemies. And now I didn't think it as in the old days, like maybe we should take down the anti-Pelosi ads for like a week here out of respect, you know, which would have been the kind of thing that would have happened 10 years ago. So and the anti-Pelosi ads, when you look at them, are pretty... Violence adjacent, I would say. They don't say you should assault Nancy Pelosi, but the rhetoric is so overheated. So I think it's, so I think in that respect, so things are, things were better, I'd say, from my point of view. When Trump was president, the institutions and the personnel held probably a little better than I expected. For me, Ukraine was actually the key to that, which is he was impeached, he deserved to be. But basically, everyone told him no. You know, he didn't actually pull off his attempt at a rogue foreign policy in Ukraine because there were, ambassadors and State Department officials and people at the NSC and even John Bolton, who was certainly loyal to Trump in a way, who said, I'm not getting involved in that drug deal. So there were a lot of enough establishment types, to use the term loosely, who were able to mitigate, I think, the damage he did as president. The damage he did as a demagogue as president, on the other hand, in the country and to the Republican Party has been greater than I expected. The party going along is such a huge deal. You know, four years of Trump as a kind of demagogue, sort of isolated by his own party. I think we could survive that. And, many, you know, it's, it's unpleasant, but it doesn't damage. But four years, but him with the support of the party for four years is worse. After January 6th, being able to regain or never if he ever lost it, the support of the party. And now the Kerry Lake phenomenon, if you want to call it that, and the mini Kerry Lakes are going to emerge. I mean, that's, that's very bad. So in that respect, it's worse than I expected. Though I think the actual, now maybe the institutions are still stronger and maybe I should you know, recalibrate in terms of what actually they did check him a little bit as president. Maybe they can check him as a candidate, as, 
and check the party when it controls, if it controls the house and so forth. But I don't know. Um, I do think the violence is really scary. I mean, that is, we don't really have much experience uh, since, I guess, the late 60s, but even then, really since the South, you would, might almost say in the 50s and 60s, obviously back in the 20s and so forth, of what it's really like to have violence intermingled with politics and have a party that has a kind of, that's adjacent to pretty violent groups out there, or certainly individuals who can be moved to do things. So that uh, that is one thing I think that people understandably don't think about too much, but that is, it is worse. Well, that's a sober note. It focuses the mind. Thank you. Everybody, I know how busy you are and how many invitations, conversations you have. Thanks so much for your contributions, valuable time. Bill, Will, this weekend, next week, we'll continue to watch you, read you, listen to you, choose you, and uh, thank you. This has been a fabulous conversation. We're really grateful. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks all. Be well. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm.